Are you searching for answers? Discover your true identity. Stay tuned to Shalom World. Welcome to our sharing on St. John's Gospel. Uh, I left you high and dry last week, uh, having asked the question as to who John the Baptist was, and I didn't answer the question for you, so we need to look at it in uh, a way now so that we'll see it in a much more um, satisfying way. So the question is, who is John the Baptist? Now, you and I know that he was a cousin of Jesus, but that's irrelevant. That's not knowing Jesus. Knowing Jesus is completely different and you're going to hear John saying that knowing Jesus is a completely different thing. He said he was not the Christ. He said he was not Elijah and he said he was not the prophet. He, but he was Elijah. And we know from the, the uh, synoptic gospels that Jesus said he was the Elijah. So let me give you the prophecy from Malachi uh, so that you will hear that he was the Elijah. This is Malachi chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And Malachi said that Elijah, who had been assumed into heaven at the end of his life, would return to Israel uh, before the great day of the Lord. Now, the great day of the Lord, Yom Yahweh, the day of God's visitation. So he said, know that I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before my day comes, the great and terrible day. He shall turn the hearts of fathers towards their children and the hearts of children towards their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a curse. There's the most wonderful description as to how to convert a nation is to turn the hearts of fathers towards their children and the hearts of children towards their fathers. In other words, to have a nation turn back to God, we have to restore the family and we have to restore the proper authority that's in the family and the proper relationship between the father and his children because the model is God the father and his beloved son. And if we forget that that's the model, our family lives will literally go haywire and we will not know what God wants. Uh, we know from the synoptic gospels that this is all dealt with, but we can't deal with it here. We know that um, John the Baptist only admitted to being the voice in the wilderness. But the voice in the wilderness, I said, told you in our last episode, was the voice that prepared them for the new era of redemption, which also meant, of course, that John was the precursor to the Messiah. But what about this prophet? Elijah was a prophet. So why did they distinguish between Elijah and that prophet? And the reason is a very important uh, prophecy that was given in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 18 from verses 15 to 18. And this is Moses speaking to his people. He said, I will raise up a prophet like myself for them from their own brothers. I will put my words into his mouth and he shall tell them all that I command him. The man who does not listen to my words that he speaks in my name shall be answerable to me for it. This is very telling, terribly important. So they all knew that there was to be a prophet like Moses coming. They just weren't sure if the Messiah and the prophet like Moses was one. They were not sure of that. That was the delegation coming from Jerusalem trying to find out who John the Baptist was. We know from all of the four Gospels that Jesus was the prophet like Moses and that he was the Messiah, all in one, because that was what was intended. 
And we find at the end of the Gospels, the four Gospels, that the people of Israel who absolutely rejected the Messiah sent to them did have to deal with God and they did have to face a judgment in AD 70 and beyond. So John the Baptist's no, no, no is actually terribly important because Jesus was everything that John was not. He is, I am not, is what he was saying. And so uh, his duty was to point out uh, the difference between himself and Jesus. And he, he answered them in a most wonderful way. These men were sent by the Pharisees and they put this further question to him. Why are you baptizing? If you're not the Christ, you're not Elijah and you're not the prophet. And John replied, I baptize you with water, but there stands among you unknown to you, the one who is coming after me and I am not fit to undo his sandal strap. He is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John says, the difference between me and Jesus is the difference between water and the spirit. Water is material, the spirit is spiritual. In other words, there's an infinite distance between us. The two of us look like men, we are men, there are only six months in between them, but that's not the reality of who they actually are. So John is from the earth below and Jesus is from heaven. He has come from the Father. He's come from above. John belongs to the covenant of Moses, which is earthly. And Jesus is going to give us the new and eternal covenant that will last forever. A covenant of love between us who deserve nothing and he who is mercy personified. So here's the above and below levels. And John the Baptist knew exactly where he stood. Uh, he was a person who was happy with the, the place he was given. He was not somebody who wanted to be somebody else. You know, people who have found who they are are happy people. Okay. And yet, you know, they said, but why are you baptizing? Well, he was baptizing because he was the precursor and he was the Elijah. But there was something else as well. And that is that in Ezekiel 36, 25, the Lord said, I shall pour clean water on you and you will be cleansed. So John was to give them the purification to prepare them for the coming of the Lord. And he knew his position and he accepted it. So now we have a witness between John and the people. Uh, what is he going to say to them? So this is from verse 29. The next day, seeing Jesus coming towards him, John said, look, there's the Lamb of God. Now he was pointing to a man who was 30 years old. Why on earth would you use the language, a lamb, an animal? There is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I spoke about when I said, a man is coming after me who ranks before me because he existed before me and I didn't know him myself. Now he knew Jesus as his relative, as his cousin. He had to have a revelation in order to understand who Jesus really was. And John, who was writing the gospel, is telling us that we may know all kinds of facts about Jesus of Nazareth, but we will not know him until something breaks in our hearts and we open up to divine revelation. There's absolutely no point in getting a PhD on John's gospel and going to hell. It's a total waste of time. But receiving this testimony and opening the heart and allowing divine revelation to infuse the knowledge as to who Jesus of Nazareth is, that's what it's all about. And earlier John had said something that I was almost going to forget to talk about. And that's in verse 26. John said, the one you've been looking for for centuries, he's actually in the crowd. He's here, but he's unknown to you. And the, the, the awful thing is that for the three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, that Jesus was apparently unknown, I said apparently, to the leadership because they rejected all his evidence. But the really sad thing as I speak 21 centuries later is that Jesus is among us and he's unknown. The vast majority in our societies do not know him. And yet he's with us in all the tabernacles of the world. He's with us in his word. 
He's present to us. He is present in the world, in the body of Christ, and yet the world does not know him. It's really, really sad. And the reason is that we will not open up and we will not turn to God and we will not allow this divine revelation to come to us. He is unknown. But for those of us who have discovered him, for those of us who do know him, we understand perfectly what John is saying, that I am not fit to undo his sandal strap. Now, that language that is being used here is the language of the Roman Empire. Rome at the time was a place where there was approximately, I may be exaggerating, but there was approximately one third citizens and two thirds slaves and servants. So that the one third citizens had nothing to do. Even a slave would fix your sandals for you. You wouldn't have to do anything. And so what John is saying is, I am not fit to be his slave. Now we know from the testimony of the other gospels, which was in circulation before this gospel was written, we know that John the Baptist was the greatest born of woman at the time. And yet he said, I am not fit to be this man's slave. So this is the incredible testimony that John gave to Jesus. And the people who were around, who, whose hearts were open, who could actually hear what was being said, they turned to Jesus and they began following Jesus. It's really a very wonderful thing. Um, so there is the Lamb of God. There is the one who will take away the sin of the world, is what John said. Listen to the testimony of Peter uh, years after the resurrection of Jesus gives us in 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. And he's speaking to the Christians who are now part of the community of the beloved disciples. Remember the ransom that was paid to free you from the useless way of life that your ancestors handed down. This was not paid by anything corruptible, neither in silver nor in gold. It was paid in the precious blood of a lamb without spot or stain. Here's Peter truly appreciating, there is the Lamb of God. When you go to the book of Revelation, chapter 5, verse 6, the other book that John wrote, you have a most wonderful picture where he says, Then I saw, standing between the throne and the four animals and the circle of elders, a lamb that seemed to have been sacrificed. It had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, and so on. He describes Jesus as the Lamb of God. Now, of course, if Jesus is pointed out as the Lamb of God, it means a lamb for sacrifice. It means that Jesus is indeed the suffering servant of Isaiah. And he fulfills the four servant songs of Isaiah, Isaiah 42, 49, 50 and 53. Therefore, Jesus is the sacrifice that sets us free. Now, they had been offering lambs to God for centuries, particularly the Passover lamb. And they knew that in offering the Passover lamb, they were asking God for forgiveness of their sins. They knew that. That was the big thing. They also knew, and the rabbis taught it to them, that the real forgiveness wouldn't come until Messiah came. And John the Baptist said, there's the one who will give you the real forgiveness, the real thing. And if you understand forgiveness, I'm not going to go into it in detail, this is not the place, but forgiveness is the key to heaven. And forgiveness is also the key to happiness. And if you are sick, forgiveness is the key to health. Maybe somebody will talk to you about that someday. It's very important. Jesus is the key. He's the key to heaven. He's the key to health. He's the key to happiness. He's the key to everything. And all of us are given an opportunity in our lives to operate the key of forgiveness. So since Jesus is pointed out as the lamb, then it means he's the Passover lamb. And we need to know that at the time uh, when they were coming up to the Passover feast, they normally chose whatever lamb they were going to sacrifice three to four days ahead of the actual sacrifice. And here is Jesus pointed out three and a half years exactly before his sacrifice. The exactness of the, the scriptures is utterly amazing. Um, 
So Jesus is the lamb. And the other thing that I want to just emphasize again is that John said, I did not know him myself. But he who sent me to baptize with water said, now he received a revelation from God because he was the precursor and he was the one to point out who the Messiah was to the people of God. He said that what God the Father said to him was, the man on whom you see the spirit come down and rest, he is the one who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now to baptize means to be completely immersed in. Now you can only give what you have. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't give the Holy Spirit. And so the sign that was given uh, here, now John doesn't go into the, the baptism of Jesus, that's already been dealt with in the Synoptic Gospels, but he gives you this very important sign. Okay, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and rest is the one that was going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yes, he said, I have seen this sign and I bear witness that he is the chosen one of God. Now, once John the Baptist does this, his job is actually over. He is the Messiah. He's the chosen one. He's the prophet. He's everything. So what is this symbol of a dove? It's very interesting. Some people think uh, that the symbol of the dove means that the Holy Spirit is all nice and lovey-dovey, excuse me for using an English expression. That means that he's all soft and nice. You couldn't be further from the truth. When the Holy Spirit came down on the apostles and Blessed Mother on Pentecost, he came in tongues of fire and he electrified those men and they sent out and they said, we have to go out and preach. The Holy Spirit's not this sort of lovey-dovey thing. Not at all. He's fire. He's the fire of God. But he's a fire of love. And he absolutely galvanized those men who had been lackadaisical and they had not really thoroughly understood who Jesus was. From the moment the Holy Spirit came, they were absolutely on fire, inflamed. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So we're, when we go into chapter three, we will hear Jesus saying that everybody has to be baptized in water and the Holy Spirit. So we'll deal with that there. Okay. Um, but if you go back to the book of Genesis, in chapter eight, verse 11, you find that Noah sent a dove out from the ark to find out if he could land on the earth after the terrifying event of the flood. And the, olive, the dove came back with an olive branch in its mouth. And we don't seem to realize that that olive branch is the cross. The olive branch said, yes, there's new life out there. Yes, you can start all over again. It's okay. The past is gone. You can forget the past. There is a new future. And it is the cross of Jesus Christ that is the olive branch for the whole human race saying, Folks, you can start all over again. I've paid the price. The past is gone. You can forget about it. Let's start again. It's the most wonderful thing. But there's something else. And that is that in chapter one of the book of Genesis, you're told uh, that before creation, there was chaos all over the place. Won't go into that now. It's a big subject. And the Spirit of God hovered over this chaos. And when the Spirit of God hovered over this chaos, the Word of God was sent forth and brought order out of that chaos and brought everything into being. That was at the dawn of creation. Here you have the dawn of redemption and you have the same Spirit of God hovering over the Son of Man, hovering over the one who is the Messiah. And all the chaos of all the fall and all its fallout and all the sins and the disasters of the human race, he is going to bring the order of redemption back to the human race and he's going to put us back on the pathway to God. It's a wonderful thing. So there's the Spirit of God hovering at the dawn of creation and the Spirit of God hovering at the dawn of redemption as well. So that's the testimony that John the Baptist has given. Uh, he gave a, a testimony to the Judean authorities and he gave the testimony to uh, 
the disciples. And now what I want to do is uh, go into his testimony to uh, the, uh, the people whom we call the apostles. His witness to the disciples of Jesus. And there's a double theme that I want to deal with here. And that is that I've already said uh, that the, the Spirit of God hovered over uh, the chaos at the dawn of creation and now hovers over the Son of Man at the dawn of redemption. In chapter one of John's Gospel, John deliberately gives you a seven day creation account. It's absolutely amazing. He does it deliberately because he wants you to read Genesis chapter one and John chapter one parallel and I will give it to you. Okay, uh, so we'll just take it nice and uh, easy. Uh, and you'll realize that in this gospel, things are not what they seem, not at all. So after the testimony that John has given, uh, you're told from, uh, this is the testimony to Jesus' disciples now. Uh, this is chapter one from verse 35. The following day, as John stood there, two of his disciples, and we discovered that these two men later on are John himself, and Andrew, okay. But they're not named here. John doesn't name disciples except Peter. Uh, Jesus passed by and John stared hard at him. And now he's talking to his own disciples and he says, there is the Lamb of God. And hearing this, you see, you're dealing with disciples. You're dealing with people who actually believe. You're dealing with people who have opened up to the ministry of John. And anyone who will open up to the ministry of John will open up to the ministry of Jesus. There's the logic. So hearing this, the two disciples followed Jesus. They simply walk away from John because that's what John said, there's your Messiah. Jesus turned around and he saw them following him and he said, what do you want? You see the questions that come up. John isn't just writing that, saying something about the past. John is saying that to you and me as we're confronting the text. What is it that you want in life? Do you really want God's highest and God's best? Do you really want to live on the, the realm of above? Do you really want to know all the glory of God? Do you really want to see the, the, the face of God in the face of Jesus Christ? Do you really want it? What do you want? And they answered, Rabbi. Now, Rabbi means teacher. They're only starting their journey. They will very quickly shift to Lord but not now. Rabbi, they said, where do you live? They don't know what to say, but they're indicating that they want to be with him and they want to be part of his entourage. They probably don't know they're the very first disciples. They discover it rather quickly. And Jesus said, come and see. That is, come and experience this for yourself, okay? And they went and they saw where he lived and they stayed with him for the rest of the day. It was about the 10th hour. Okay, so here's the beginning of disciples coming to Jesus. So we'll just do this first and then I'll do the creation uh, after this. Okay, um, when Jesus said, what do you want? He was trying to touch the deepest thing inside of us, which is our insatiable need for the divine. We don't know we have an insatiable need for the divine, but we do know that we have a, an ache inside of us that says, I want something and I don't know what I want. And people drown it with alcohol or sex or money or power or whatever they drown it with. And they come away still having this ache that has not been satisfied. And so what do you want is extremely important uh, for Jesus and for us. And this is, I'm pointing them out because John wants you to touch his text and to touch it with grace and to give a response of grace to this text, okay? So when Jesus says, come and see, he's inviting you to a life of faith, to open up to the word of God, to start walking with him and to begin to penetrate the mystery of his person. So this walking with him is a, a life-giving, life-changing, experience of prayer. We have a prayer relationship with him. And he says, John says, they went and they stayed with him. 
So not only do you open up to him and enter into a relationship of prayer with him, but you must stay, you must persevere, because otherwise you will not uh, even have the time to penetrate the mystery of his person. Uh, and it's in chapter two that these men will begin to see his glory as he begins to reveal it to them. So we will continue with our Odyssey next time. Thank you for listening. Sláin agus bánach dé live. Goodbye. God bless you. It's a great joy for me to endorse Shalom World TV. I was delighted to hear that they were going to be based in Port Leisha, in our diocese, in a studio there in the parish, to base their Irish operation. I'm delighted to welcome the Shalom team. They will be invaluable partners for the Meeting of the World Meeting of Families when we host it in Dublin in 2018. And they'll be a marvellous tool to deepen the evangelization and the spreading of the good news around our country. The greatest challenge today for all of us in faith is communication. Communicating the message and doing it well. I thank Shalom for making their contribution to the world of media and their contribution to allowing the good news to be heard to the ends of the earth. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit bless all who work in Shalom and all who watch their stations. May St. Bridget accompany you on your journey. May St. Conlet be with you and St. Lazarian stay beside you. Amen.